If you have your Bibles, please turn to Titus chapter 3. We're going to start from verse 3 all the way to the end of the book in verse 15. We're going to close out, as Pastor Bo mentioned, on the series called Motivation with part 6. As we're closing out our study in the book of Titus in this motivation series, I hope that you got a better grasp of another book of the Bible. One of our hopes and prayers is that anyone who is part of our church, we will be more Bible literate. We understand the Word of God. Not just because we're a Christian, but this is life to us. This is the Word that can transform us. Another major reason why we decided to cover this book was we want to keep on reinforcing in our church about what should motivate you to do anything in life, whether it's to speak up in certain situations of injustice, whether it's to be able to be a good worker in your workplace or in your school to represent Jesus Christ. I pray that everything that you do will be motivated because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If it's motivated motivated by anything else, fear, fear of people, expectation of people, trying to please people, I'm going to tell you right now, you are going to be left devastated. That should not be our motivation for the things that we do, whether it's serving or whether it's just doing anything in life. We should be motivated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why we said that we wanted to see all of us become more gospel fluent. We will speak this gospel language to ourselves, speak it to others in our community, speak it to those who are in desperate need of the hope of Jesus Christ. So I wanted to start off as you've turned to Titus chapter 3, is I want you to really think of Think about a time um, when, or even now, if there is a habit or an addiction that you have or you had, and you've been trying to overcome and trying to break free from that particular issue, whatever it may be for you. And I'm wondering how many of us understand the pain and the frustration of trying to break out of this cycle. And many of you know the cycle. The cycle is doing that habit, and then you're feeling guilty. And when you start feeling guilty, you don't want to turn to God. You want to hide, and that's why it leads to shame. It leads to a lot of of frustration in your own heart and condemnation that comes upon you. And then from there, you somehow muster up enough courage to turn to God and ask for forgiveness, and you feel God's forgiveness, sometimes even through people as you confess and open up and share and then you're doing good for a little bit, and then you fall back into that habit or that addiction. This is the cycle, and I don't know how many of you understand that this cycle is the very cycle that Satan uses to push you further away from God rather than closer to him. Studies have shown that people are getting more addicted to things related to the Internet. In fact, whether it's social media or even binge watching, streaming movies or TV series, we're seeing that literally people, their brains are being altered completely differently. And that's why I think it is an issue for us psychologically, emotionally, as we see more issues of mental health, depression, and different things going on. I wanted to quickly show you this video that explains a little bit about the internet addiction that we're seeing now in our generation. So let's watch this together, and then I'll come back up. Something to think about. Are we addicted to the Internet? And as it mentioned in that video, that sometimes through this gateway, if you want to look at it that way, leads to many other addictions in our lives. I think many of us in this room, we know the struggle, and we know the feeling the emotions of trying to overcome some kind of addiction or a habit in your life. For some of us, I think it's, as I mentioned earlier, binge watching, whether it's Netflix or YouTube. And what would seem to be only a 20-minute thing, now it's leading to three hours, and you can't get anything done. For some of us, I think it's with alcohol, and that also leads to drugs in different forms. For some of us, it's pornography. For some of us, it might be a toxic relationship with somebody that you know that it's not healthy, but you keep on going back. 
The problem is that so many of us are trying to overcome these things in our own power and our own strength. And the worst part is that we keep on failing and it leads us to further depression and mental issues that come from these struggles. I think at best, some of us are trying to cover it up with our own self-righteousness as we serve more, trying to live a good Christian life. But we never experience true transformation deep in our hearts. And that's why we just relegate ourselves to living this fake life when deep inside we are dying. I love what Tim Keller said in his book, The Prodigal God. Listen to what he writes. Faith in the gospel restructures our motivations, our self-understanding, our identity, and our view of the world. Behavioral compliance to rules without heart change can be superficial and fleeting. This describes so many Christians in Asia and around the world. That the gospel of Jesus Christ has now completely altered and changed our motivations, the way we think, the way we do things. So what we settle for is these superficial changes because we try to do all these good things. That's why when you face a trial in your life or a suffering, you tend to completely unravel instead of standing firm in the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. Some of you, when you face certain things that maybe don't go your way, we begin to completely get bitter at God. Why? Because things are not going the way we expect it to go. I think God is constantly reminding us that the gospel must elevate the way we live our lives as well as to motivate us the way we should live. So let me talk about two things and see what the gospel should do in our lives and what it should be doing right now. The first point I want to mention here as we close out the book of Titus is the gospel fuels us. Everyone say that, come on. The gospel fuels us. It must fuel our lives and the way we live our lives. I want to just mention earlier in verses 1 and 2, as Pastor Bo mentioned last week as he closed out in that part of the section there, We see that Paul reminds the believers that their relationship with people should be characterized by gentleness and courtesy. Now, this is important for you to understand. It is in the spirit of humility and being big-hearted that will distinguish us from as followers of Christ who ultimately set the example and we take the example from Christ in learning how to love people. In order to make this argument stronger, Paul brings in this gospel paradigm. We cannot talk about behavior without understanding what motivates our behavior. And that's why I want us to think about this for a moment. Why is it important to understand the whys in doing something rather than just doing it? I want you to think about that for a moment. Why is it so crucial and important that you understand why you do something rather than just doing it? I think many of us can answer that question very well because you just have to look into your own life. If we just do something because we're told to do it without knowing why, then it's easy to get bitter later on. I don't know how many people I've seen get bitter at God, get bitter at the church, get bitter at their parents, get bitter at other people because they're doing things without knowing why they're doing it. And after a certain while, you're like, why am I doing this? And you tend to get angry and you get bitter at people around you and you play the blame game and you play the victim. I think another reason is you think about it is that if you don't understand the why, I've seen so many people get disillusioned with Christianity, with prayer, with reading the Bible because you don't know why you're doing it. Just recently I was talking to uh, one of my friends and we just we were just sitting down and talking back in the States uh, for like three hours. I, I, we were going to only meet for an hour, but it ended up being three hours. So forget his sermon preparation and all that. But anyway, we were we were talking together. And I don't know how we just kind of went into this topic of parenting. And I was just sharing with just some of the different things that 
uh, just even uh, for Christina and I, just ourselves, just trying to be a good parent with kids and these teenagers and now slowly getting out of the house is a whole different issue than raising kids when they were younger. And as we were talking, I was just sharing also that uh, we, we've been, we as a church, we've been struggling with many parents who can't let their kids go. So we have kids who come to college, to the university here in Hong Kong, and parents are like not only helicoptering, but they are just, they're hoverboarding, uh, they're, they're doing everything over them. And I'm just realizing this kid will never grow up. This kid will be a kid for the rest of their lives. The parents don't understand that you are literally crippling them for the future. They are not your kid. That child that has been given to you is from God. And God could take that child away in an instant, and that's when we'll get humble. Or that child that you thought was so nice and listening to you and everything that you try to raise them up with, and they totally disobey. So we're having this discussion now, and one of the things that I concluded was this as we're talking. I told my friend, I said, one of the things I'm realizing is those kids who come to Hong Kong to these universities who were sheltered and always did what their parents wanted them to do, not knowing why they're doing it, but always doing what their parents wanted them to do. When they come to college, they go buck wild. Sorry for the American colloquialism. They just go crazy. They get drunk. They go to all the bars. They're sleeping around. They're, they're not even studying. They're just going crazy. And the sad part is, parents, you're not there. And I've seen this for the 20-some years. Some of the people who grew up in the church, the nicest people, they come to college because they never understood why they were doing what they were doing. Why did they go to church? They don't know why. Why did they listen to their parents? They don't know why. They just know that they wanted their acceptance. They don't know why they're doing. Why are they studying? Why are you trying to get into that university? Why are you trying to get that job? Because you have no idea why you're doing what you're doing when you get in a situation where you need to know why you're doing it. A lot of times you will just totally just let things go. I think this is why as we talk about the gospel, we cannot talk about it without realizing who we were before and who we are now. That's why let me look at this. As we talk about the gospel, it must fuel us I want to talk about with these two lens as we look into the gospel. I want to first talk about our past. Let's go ahead and read verse 3. This is what the Word of God says. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. It says this. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. I want to pause here on this just one verse as we talk about how the gospel should fuel us and we have to talk about our past. As we look at this list, we see that it is a descriptor of the things that we used to do and the way we used to think before understanding the gospel. Let me read it for you in this verse in the New Living Translation. It says this, once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other. What Paul makes very clear is this, before you came to know Jesus Christ, that you and I, we were deceived, we were disobedient, and we were depraved. This is our description of who we were before we encountered Jesus Christ. We were disobedient, we were deceived, and we were depraved. And I think this is the reason why it is so important to remember the life that we lived before we came to experience the gospel so that we can be humble and as we relate with people. Now, you don't have to tell people any of this stuff, especially when they had a messed up life and they experienced the wonderful grace of Jesus Christ. They understand this. But the problem is those of you who went to church all your life. And you think you're a good kid. You're a good person. You're talented in music. You got the highest marks in your schools. You were well-liked. 
even to this day, even as you're working, some of you working people, you're a great worker, everyone loves you, everyone wants to have lunch with you. You can be great at something, but terrible in your heart. And that was a problem with the prodigal son, the older one. Even though he was in the father's house, his far, heart was so far away from the father. There's some of you who grew up in the church all your life, but your heart is so far away from the father. Because for you, you're your God. You worship yourself in all that you do. Your self-righteousness. Your self-centeredness. I don't know about you, but when you begin to understand how disobedient, deceived, and depraved that we are, and then you begin to get a glimpse of the grace of God that you don't deserve, it will change you. Because Paul, who's writing this letter, always talked about who he was before he met Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 through 16, listen to what it says. Once again, it's been a while, but on the yellow, you got to read it with me. Amen? At the recent retreat that I went to, they kept on messing it up, so I had to like prime them. Okay, it's coming. It's, it's, it's yellow, but I don't think I have to do that because, you know, we've been doing this for a month. Are you guys ready? Turn to somebody next to you and say, are you ready? Here we go. Even though I was once a blasphemer, this is Apostle Paul speaking, and a uh, persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that is in Christ Jesus. Here's a trust worthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who will believe on him and receive eternal life. How about us this morning? I'm wondering how many of us try to remember what kind of life we used to live before experiencing God's grace and this gospel message. Can I ask you, honestly, just to think this for a moment? Where would you be right now if you had not experienced this gospel? Some of you are like, I would have been sleeping by now. <laughs> or still been sleeping. But think about that. Like, when you understand this gospel... There is no room for pride. There is no room for insecurity. There's no room for backstabbing. There's no room for self-centeredness because it's not about you. It's all that God has done in your life. And all you can say is, God, I don't deserve this. I was once a deceiver. I was disobedient. I was depraved. But you show me your unlimited patience and your grace that a, wor a sinner, as worse as I, a sinner like me, now the world can see that God could change him, he can change anybody. So that's why when you talk about the gospel fueling us, we have to talk about our past. And now I want to talk about our present. Let's go ahead and read verse 4 through 7 as he continues. It says this in Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. One thing that we have to note is there is a dramatic change in tone from verse 3 to verse 4. In fact, let me put it this way. In verse 3, the focus is all on us. But now when you read verse 4, you'll realize the focus is all on God. That really is part of the gospel, is to understand your sinfulness, but yet you don't 
park it there and loathe yourself and have the self-pity party. But then you look and you realize it's not about me, but it's what God did for me in spite of my weaknesses, in spite of my disobedience, in spite of my deception, in spite of my depravity. That's why the key phrase is in verse 4. It says, but when. Everyone say, but when. It was God's goodness and loving kindness that appeared. God's love was demonstrated. It wasn't a theory. It was demonstrated by sending his son, Jesus Christ. That's why God's salvation was by grace alone. And there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. In our own depravity, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We're literally dead in our sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says this in the New Living Translation. God saved you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Let's read it in the message translation. Just verse 8 and 9 again. But once again, read it with me in the yellow. It says this. Saving is all his idea and all his work. I want you to just think about it. It's He came up with it. He decided upon it. And he decided to do it. It's all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we've done the whole thing. Amen? That's us. We don't have, we're not the, the main actor in this. It's God. The truth is that we have been saved by, from our sins by grace. We've been justified by grace. Now we are heirs and have hope of this eternal life, which is by grace. The grace of God must be motivation for godly living. It's not because we're fearful or we're not going to get somebody or our leader is going to yell at us or maybe God's going to punish us. The motivation of why we try to live holy lives is because of this gospel that we've experienced, the love of God that we don't deserve. That should motivate us. And without this motivation, which is the gospel, we're just going to go back to our human paradigm, trying to earn something from God and even try to receive approval from people. And that's why when we don't, we get devastated. I think knowing this truth of the gospel should free us in the way we elevate and motivate ourselves to live for Christ every single day. Let me look at verse 8 really quick here. It says this, the saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. The Apostle Paul mentions that everything he stated is a trustworthy saying. Therefore, he's expecting Titus to live by them and also exhorting others to live by them. That's why if you look at this carefully, you will notice in verse 8 it says, I want you to insist on these things. The end result will be that God's people will be careful, carefully devoting themselves to good works. Once again, the gospel must elevate and motivate the way we live our lives. Look at the phrase, even good works. It entails that anything that glorifies God and where people can benefit and give praise to God, those are good works. How do we know that? Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Remember Jesus when he says this? And I want you to read the yellow with me. It says this. In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I think this is one of the most powerful things if you think about this in your own life. A lot of times we want to do great things to glorify God. But I think when we do ordinary things with the desire to glorify God, then they will become extraordinary things. Think about some of the ordinary things of your life right now. Getting up every morning to go to work. Helping your kids get ready. Getting up and then going to class. Getting up and just doing other things and taking care of the things that you need to. Running the errands that you need to. Ordinary things of life can be extraordinary when we have a heart and a desire to glorify God through those things. How about us this morning? Is the gospel elevating and motivating the way you live your life? Does the gospel message fuel you 
to live your life to glorify him, even in the daily tasks. I'm wondering if our good works are motivated by the gospel and it's really bringing praise to God. So once again, the gospel fuels us. Let me close with the second point is this. The gospel not only fuels us, but the gospel focuses us. The gospel focuses us. I want to go ahead and read verse 9 through 11. It says this. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a man, a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, having nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Now, Paul gives kind of some exhortations to avoid, especially those things that will bring dissension or division. And he mentions foolish controversies, genealogies, just these minute details in the law. And the reason behind this, listen to me carefully, the reason behind this is that they are unprofitable and worthless. Listen to these other translations of those phrase of unprofitable and worthless. In the New Living Translation, it says this, these things are useless and a waste of time. The Message Translation says, that gets you nowhere. What Paul is saying is a person who stirs up division is someone who's constantly insisting on one's own opinion to the extent that it causes division in the community. Now, can I just be clear first on this issue? Paul is not saying that there should never be any disagreements. That is not what he's saying. Because we're all different. God has shaped us and molded us and given us different experiences. And there might be certain things that we look at and we look at it completely different. And what he's saying is that's okay. I think we live in a culture where we, we, we are afraid to disagree. And if you look at some of the political discussions and things that are going on or just all over the world, I mean, it gets very vile and almost to the point where it gets very nasty, especially when someone disagrees with you and then it's easy to belittle them and put them down. I think you can have discussions and disagree respectfully. So Paul is not saying that in a church, everyone has to agree. That is not what he's saying. There will be differences. And how you view different things, how you raise your kids, there's going to be differences. When to put them to sleep, there's going to be differences. Because if you put them to sleep really late, then you're not going to have time in the evening. But if you put them to sleep too early, then they're going to wake up early and then you're tired. So it really is up to the families. Whether you do OT or not. Some people say, well, you made a commitment, so you should. All I can say is there's going to be varying differences in different things. So that's not what he's arguing for, but what he's clearly saying is this. There are people who are bringing up division with things that do not really matter in the light of eternity and bigger things. In fact, what he's trying to expose is these self-centered people who are trying to bring up division because they want things done their way. Can I just pause here and say this to some of you? And you probably experienced this in your life group and probably experienced this in different contexts. And don't raise your hand. You don't want to put anyone in a guilty position here. Have you met anybody who's always complaining? They're complaining about something. Something about life group, something about church, just something about that person. Oh, my God, they always come without a shower. You, you could just smell him, and oh, my God. I mean, they, 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 they have something to complain about, just everything and anything. And it almost seems like wherever they are, it's like, the miracle of splitting the Red Sea. You know, people are divided. They just have that gift of dividing. Instead of multiplying. Never mind. Um, this is Asia. This is a math joke. But anyway, it's okay. I get it. I get it. And so, you think to yourself, why is that person always complaining or always trying to bring division amongst people? And I'm just going to give you a counseling tip. Usually those kinds of people, well, number one, not only are they self-centered. Number two, there's something that they want that they do not get or they're not getting. 
which fuels their self-centeredness. So if you ever meet complaining people or people who are always bringing division in a group, like sometimes you got to have compassion for them because when you look at them, you realize that they either are not getting what they want and they're acting up like a little kid or something else that I've noticed is a lot of times they've been hurt. And when they're hurt in a community, then it's easy for them to bring division. They'll gossip. They'll speak negative things about people. They'll try to bring certain people towards their side. They'll try to divide other people that they are close with, the other party. And that's why Paul makes such an important pressing exhortation about those people that bring division in the church. That's why, as I shared before, I don't mind talking about injustices that we see in the city. But if you are trying to bring your own personal opinion so to bring division in the church, you're not helping. If that causes us to pray together more, to understand both sides more, then I think let's, let's, let's do it. But if it's not bringing unity, it's not building up the body of Christ. In fact, this is why I think this is one of the most powerful things about the Christian unity that no one else can do that God has given us the privilege of doing. That you can have a church of people from all nations coming together. How? That you can have people from mainland China, part of our church. People who are local Hong Kong people who are part of our church. And we can still love one another, do community together. That speaks volumes to the world because some of your friends who are local, because you're local, they're going to be like, how in the world can you? Because of Jesus. And the mainland, oh, they're going to be like, why? <laughs> what is going on? Why? Why in the world are you like follicling around with these local Hong Kong who just have no love for order or cannot respect the government because of Jesus. How powerful is that? And in these situations, Paul goes a little bit further. Now, listen to me. This is important. What do you do with these types of people that are bringing division in the church? Well, in verse 10 and 11, as we read, Titus is supposed to warn these people twice. Now, don't be like, I warn you, I'm warning you. Okay, you're out. The point is not the exact number. That is not the point. What Paul is trying to say is give the person an opportunity to repent and encourage them not to keep on sinning and bringing division in the church. If a person continues to disobey and bring disunity in the church or in the community of faith, then they are to be excluded from the fellowship of the group. Now, some of you are saying that, wow, that's pretty harsh. You have to understand in the early church, they would exclude people from the community for a set period of time so they can repent. We're not going to fellowship with you. Go and you need to repent. And then they can be brought back in because they're going to start hindering the unity of the body of Christ. So the assumption is that if the divisive person fails to respond these two warnings, then it is clear sign that the person is warped, it says here, and sinful and self-condemned. Listen to what the message translation says in verse 11. And read the yellow part with me. It's obvious that such a person is out of line, rebellious against God. By persisting in div uh, divisiveness, he cuts himself off. Like he's really set on himself. He made himself God. He is rebelling against God. And Paul's instructions for dealing with divisive people is similar to the teaching of Jesus. If you know your Bible, you realize back in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17, listen to what it says. Once again, read it along with me. It says this, if another believer sins against you, 
go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything that you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Wow. This is Jesus' teaching. And Paul is using that same principle. The thing that you need to understand is Paul is using this form of discipline because of the seriousness of the issue. We're not just talking about that they didn't have a quiet time. Oh my God, we're going to give you one warning. Here's two, you're out of here. You haven't had your quiet time. Like, think about this for a moment. Why in the world does Paul talk about division in the church in such a serious tone that you first got to bring it up with them? Hey, dude, just listen. I don't think that's very beneficial. They go, forget you. And they continue to do it. Hey, listen, we're telling you this is not very good. And we're bringing other witnesses to show you you've hurt other people. This is not good. He goes, if they still refuse to not listen, treat them as an unbeliever or pagan. And I was thinking, why is this so important to God's heart? And I realized this unity and division, it distracts us from God's mission and God's call on our lives. That's why we got to go back to the gospel to help us to focus. Why are we doing what we're doing? Can I just be a little bit more uh, forthright here as I lay it before you? We cannot rule out that sometimes Satan uses people to throw God's purposes, to completely go against the purposes of God. I'm not saying you're demon-possessed, okay? I'm not saying that you're an evil person. But sometimes in our own selfishness, Satan goes, oh, there's a little hook. This person is selfish, self-centered, immature. I'll just let them keep on being deceived in their mind so then they can be used to bring disunity in the church. And I share this humbly because we've been doing this church thing for a while. And something that I've learned every single time is that when the church starts to grow, like there's certain moments where there's a lot of disunity and divisiveness that comes into the church. And if we're not careful and on watch, I really believe that it's going to totally distract us and get us derailed from the very thing that God is calling us to do. So we've got to be on alert. So therefore, if there's some people that have hurt you, reconcile. They probably don't even know they've hurt you. But you harbor this bitterness and Satan uses that. And then you get angry and then you start gossiping. You start doing other stuff. And Satan's using that. And it's bringing division in the church. So he's using your hurt, your deceitful mind, the things that you've been deceived on is not based on the truth. To bring division in the church, to hinder and to lose focus on what it is that God is calling us to do. And that's why I'm on guard to say what God, you've given us a clear mission. You've given us, you told us what we need to do. This is the calling on our lives as a church. That that's why we planted this church here in Hong Kong. And as we keep on growing and God is blessing us, and I'm so thankful for all of you who have come even in this past year. Some of you have been with our church from day one when we first started back in 2015. But as our church begins to grow, we have to be that much more diligent and vigilant to watch and see, God, do not allow division to distract us. Help us to have the gospel before us so that we can be focused on what it is that you're calling us to do. I think, therefore, the goal is to always bring the person back into fellowship. Paul had to address the same issue with the people of Thessalonica 
Second Thess- uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, it says this in the New American Standard Bible. If anyone does not obey your instruc- our instructions in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. I love this. Listen to me. If, if you look at the message translation, it says, sit him down and talk about the problem as someone who cares. When we focus on our calling and God's mission as a community, ultimately what we want to see is people growing in their destiny in Christ. And that's why we'll do everything possible to help them. That's Paul's heart. Don't just kick them out, but your heart should be, I care for this person and I want them to repent and realize that they're not helping the community. So in order for us to elevate and motivate ourselves in the way we live, then we got to focus as the gospel help us to focus. Let me close with that verse 12 and 15. Quickly here. It says, When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me, Send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Paul closes out this letter to Titus by mentioning several people by name. And what we notice from this, as we talk about focusing on the gospel, is that Paul cares for people individually. In verse 12, we see that Paul is in the process of sending Artemis and Titus to come to replace. One of them will come to replace Titus. Think about Titus who's been there trying to serve, raising up the next leaders, and he was probably tired from doing ministry. So Paul is thinking about him and say, hey, I'm going to send someone else to you to replace you so you could probably get some rest. And even in verse 13, we see Paul was concerned about the welfare of these two, Zenus and Apollos. And he says, when they come, meet all their needs. Make sure they lack nothing. That That's a person who cares about the people that he's ministering to. Not only does he care, but I want you to notice this in verse 14 as we read. He once again mentions this idea of good works. He even uses the word devote to remind us of the importance of commitment and being faithful to what we're called to do. Paul wanted the believers to be fruitful and learning how to to be a blessing to others, especially when these urgent needs. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 It says, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Can I just say this? I'm I'm thankful for all of you who have actually been faithful in just giving just your resources, your money, your, your tithe. I've been blessed to see so many giving up your time to serve in the church, to reach out to other people. Every Sunday, I see your talents, your giftings being used to build up the church. And that comes out of a heart that is focused because the gospel has fueled our hearts to do what he has called us to do. And we're going to keep on focusing on what we're called to do, not because of what other people say to us, but because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think this simply is the gospel message because before we came to know Jesus Christ, we live for ourselves. We're driven for ourselves. But then God revealed himself through Jesus Christ, his son, who lived an unselfish, generous, and sacrificial life by dying on the cross. The very life that we could not live, the perfect life, he lived it for us. So when we think about some of these different addictions and different things that we struggle with and trying to live this godly life, we're no longer motivated by ourselves because we cannot live this life by ourselves. That's why we need Jesus that much more to make it about Jesus, because he's the only one who can help us. So therefore, the one thing, and I want to bring all this together, is simply this. The gospel must elevate and motivate the way we live. That the gospel must elevate and motivate the way we live. Can I just quickly give us some next steps to think about? Some of you are like, why do we always do next steps? Can we just leave? Because we want to be a church that has a whole spectrum of people. There are some of you who are seeker or seeking or you're seekers. You're not a believer yet. 
Our prayer is you'll take the next step that you will become a believer in Jesus Christ. Some of you have recently come to know Jesus Christ and you just kind of like, just kind of there. We want you to take the next step to be committed and following Jesus Christ. Some of you are committed, you're devoted, but we want you to take the next step to love Jesus more. So whenever we do next step, it's helping you to take the next step in your journey with God. It's going to be different for all of you, but at least take the next step and not just take these words and just walk out of here, but say, I'm going to do this and see my life being changed as I obey the word of God. The first thing is this, thank God daily for the gospel. Will you do that? Every morning you wake up, every single time you're in transit, just whenever God just reminds you, you see somebody and it's easy to kind of have pity or it's easy to just say, oh, look at that person. But think to yourself, that could have been me. That should have been me. When you go meet with some of your friends, some of you are going to go home for a little bit before the new, new uh, season of ministry starts. When you go back home and you spend time with some of your peers, those of you who have friends that you knew since grammar school or whatever the case, and you see where they are, they're totally far away from God. They used to be a leader in your youth group maybe, but now they're totally turned away from God. Instead of judging them, you should have been like, that should have been me. But God brought me to Hong Kong. He could allow me to find a church that where I could experience the gospel. So thank you, Lord, for the gospel. Can I get a good amen to that? Every single day, let's be thankful for the gospel message. And practice that. Keep on saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this gospel message. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. The second thing is this. Tell yourself every day, I do this because of the gospel. Can we practice that? All right? I do this because of the gospel. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them that. So when you wake up, what should you say to yourself? Um, yeah. You're probably thinking, but why, Lord, why? I love the gospel. I love you, but I don't want to wake up. When you go to work, when you spend time with people, I mean, I'll be honest with you. There, there are times when I, I'm just tired. I, I just don't want to meet with any more people. I don't want to go to any more meetings. And please, I, I want to make sure that we understand, like, some of you have been on the other side when people cancel meetings on you. That doesn't feel good. You feel like you're not important. They don't care about you. There are so many times I'm like, should I cancel? I could say I have jet lag. I just came back. But I always say to myself, I do this because of the gospel. Some of you on the other side, you need to understand that there are times when emergencies come up, so meeting has to be canceled or rearranged. Someone gets sick, you have to rearrange. So don't judge them. Like, you don't love me. You don't care for me. Just go self-centered. Self-centered, all right? It's not about you. But every single day as you do things, as you're sitting at work going, oh my God, I hate this. What is my life? I was really tempted uh, this past, uh, well, last week when uh, my second son got his driver's license. We're at the, the department of, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, motor vehicles or whatever that department it is remember the movie of uh, Zootopia that's the DMV it, it is slow and my uh, my second son and I we were kind of like standing there and the guy who called on us he looked just like that flaw his face everything <laughs> and I said to myself Lord this must be a nightmare in fact I was like telling him should I take a picture and show you know show mom and you know just show everybody but I'm like, no, that's mean, because, you know, that's it. So I, I mustered up some faith, and I go, no, it's, it's going to be good. So we walk up, and he was slow. <laughs> so I'm like, Lord. I do this because of the gospel. <laughs> Love for my son. I pray that as you work, as you go to school, as you spend time with friends, coworkers, your colleagues, I do this because of the gospel. And lastly, trust that God will and can change you with the gospel message.
You got to trust that he will. It's not your work. It's his work. So that's why you got to pray. You got to surrender yourself. I want to close with this uh, video a testimony of somebody who actually tried to change themselves and it failed miserably until they really began to understand that they need to connect with God as they struggle with their own addictions. And I don't know why, as I was kind of thumbing through some videos that I wanted to show about a testimony that's related to this, about trying to change while you're addicted or you're struggling with something, this testimony stuck out to me because what this person shares, I believe, is what so many of us struggle with in multiple levels. It's not just the addiction that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the issue in this person's heart that led to the addiction. That is the issue that we need to come across. And I pray that as you listen to this testimony, may you be able to relate to it on some level. And then let's believe by faith, even today as we close out, as we take communion, as we worship and as we pray, that we'll experience just the power of God in our lives. So let's close out with this together.